So good evening and welcome. This is the second episode of what we're calling Aftershocks. I think the idea has been to really go round robin around all the different conferences. So we want to break down the silos and make sure that we're all learning from each other. So as we go through each meeting, we're going to have one, uh, one or two key talks that came out of that meeting to present live as a webinar here and then push it on social media afterwards and utilize our local expertise in terms of uh, moderators from New York who can help create a dialogue about this. And the goal is to represent the data and then also try to understand how this is going to impact the field, especially for our colleagues, not just in, in electrophysiology, but also in interventional cardiology, heart failure, non-invasive, general cardiology. So we'll try to expand this quickly out of HRS uh, into the, the mainstream. After this, we'll do HFSA and we'll move on to all the major conferences, AHA, ACC, SCAI, and, and the hope is really to share information and really uh, share the expertise we have in New York with some of the experts around the country. So I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Jim Chung, who I've known for a long time. Uh, Jim and I were at uh, Cornell together. I was a junior attending, uh, and he was a EP fellow. Uh, he's obviously come a very long way since then. I see he's now a full professor at Cornell. He runs the Electrophysiology Fellowship Program and is involved to a, a large extent in the electrophysiology research and some innovative uh, research in that realm. He's going to introduce our guest speaker tonight. He's going to take us through this amazing trial that just came out a couple of weeks ago at HRS. Jim. Thanks, Hari. And, and once again, I want to thank you and uh, New York State ACC for putting this together. I think this is great. I'm just so uh, happy to be part of this. And so um, I have the dis distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Roderick Tung, who is currently the newly minted uh, Chief of Cardiology and Director of Cardiovascular Clinical Research at the University of Arizona College of Medicine and Banner University um, Medical Center in Phoenix. So first off, I want to congratulate him both on his new position and on the impressive VT ablation clinical trial he will be talking to us about in a moment. And for those of you who do not know Dr. Tang, he is a thought leader in the area of VT ablation. He has published a number of key papers on VT mechanisms that really pushed our field forward. Um, his work has really shaped and optimized the way we treat, EP, uh, treat VT in the EP lab. And so um, tonight, Rod will talk to us about the PAUSE SCD trial, which was presented just last month as a late-breaking clinical trial at the Heart Rhythm uh, Scientific Sessions. And Rod, before we go into the specific, specifics of your study, can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to embark on this journey of launching a pan-Asian multi-center VT ablation study? Absolutely. Thanks, Jim and, and Hari. I want to commend you on a fantastic initiative. This is exemplary to be able to learn from each other. I do think cardiology is too siloed, and this is an amazing exemplary initiative that Arizona is going to have to follow suit on and try to kind of come close with. I will tell you that my background is not a virtual background. Those are the real mountains there here in Phoenix. So um, without further ado, I started having the tremendous opportunity, and Jim has done this too, to go to Asia and with different industry partners to start trying to teach, have exchanges about newer techniques, contemporary techniques about ventricular tachycardia ablation. And some of these little tours of Asia would actually be 12 cities in 10 days where they would book different cases and we'd take these all on. And through these interchanges, was going there about two or three times a year and felt like this is fine and it's great, but we need to start putting this in the context of a trial and put all these cases that we're doing and put it in some form of a prospective framework. And that's where we started feeling like this would be a great way as China was very new to the VT ablation space and AFib is the dominant player. Uh, this was a great way for us to put it into an academic construct and therefore pause was born. And we decided let's create the first multi-center trial in Asia, but there was also an opportunity to explore sudden death as a distinctly understudied entity in Asia. And that's for many reasons. ICDs are not universally prescribed. They have to pay for defibrillators in Asia. Same is true in India. Not all of it's covered by insurance. So when you think about it, the, the penetration of ICD is not the same level as it is in the States. And in that regard, it's a great environment to study ablation sans background ICD, which is not ethical in America. Right now, we see someone with heart failure, they meet criteria for scud heft or made it, and they have to have an ICD. 
but we definitely have situations in which patients were refusing, et cetera, and we'll get into that trial design. So the bottom line is fertile grounds for exploration across China and an unprecedented collaboration across Japan, China, mainland China, I'm, I'm sorry, Taiwan and uh, Korea. So I will present what I presented at the Heart Rhythm Society in Boston as a late breaker and feel free to interrupt me at any point, even mid sentence. We want this to be interactive as well. So this is a randomized trial of early first line catheter ablation for VT called the Pan-Asia US Sudden Cardiac Death Trial. And this is on behalf of all the investigators. There are numerous disclosures with various mapping systems that need to be noted. And the ones that were related to Abbott are relevant because Abbott provided partial sponsorship for this. So when we look at VT ablation, it's not very mature in terms of evidence-based practice. It's universally performed in specialized centers, but there's a paucity of multi-center randomized trials to assess the role of VT ablation and particularly as a first line strategy. We all know someone comes in with VT, it's amio, it's amio, it's more amio. But what about questioning the status quo and thinking maybe it shouldn't be more and more amio, maybe we should be ablating patients up front. And as we all may or may not know in New England Journal of Medicine, two headlining articles with atrial fibrillation, early AF and stop AF showed that ablation is actually superior to antiarrhythmic drug therapy as a first line. So this in a way is coming at a very good time of looking at VT in that same lens. Three prior trials have shown benefits. Smash VT in, in New England Journal, 2007, VTAC, 2009, 2010, Lancet, and Vanish New England Journal of Medicine by John Sapp, now 2017. But they only enrolled ischemic cardiomyopathy. Non-ischemic, as we all know across disciplines, is the biggest challenge in heart failure, right? So these are the patients that are being increasingly referred for advanced heart failure therapies, and they're understudied in the EP world. To date, no trials have included non-ischemics, and none of them have actually been conducted in Asia when you think about it with a very Amerocentric and Eurocentric view of the world. You've got 1.4 billion people in China and 1.6 billion in India. And the data that we always prescribe for guidelines may not be relevant to an Asian population because of lifestyle, because of racial, because of genetic predisposition, et cetera. Phenotypes may actually indeed be different. And we understand that with coronary disease, something recently just came out with South, South Asian and Indian. It's just, there's, there are different genetics involved here as well. And the profile of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy may be different as well. We wanted to compare early first line catheter ablation of monomorphic VT with conventional medical therapy as the control in structural heart disease in patients that newly have an indication for ICD. So this again is very early on. It's not patients that are suffering down the road. These patients are coming in with VT, don't even have an ICD yet. And the hypothesis is that early catheter ablation may reduce the composite endpoint of VT recurrence, hospitalization, cardiovascular type, or death. Secondary aims were to look at them individually, this triple composite, and then to examine the outcomes of ablation sans ICD in those patients that either didn't want, couldn't afford, refused randomization. There are cultural issues with defibrillators that many Asian patients do not want a mechanical device. They are distrusting of technology or they don't really want to pay for it or they can't afford it, but they don't want to pay there are barriers to ICD adoption in Asia. And therefore, the ones that did not get randomized, we put in a parallel cohort to look at ablation without background ICD, which if you think about it, is very scary. We all think that's scary, but we'll talk about that as well. The methods are that this was investigator-initiated, prospective, international, multi-center, 11 sites, China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, one-to-one -one randomization, Structural heart disease less than 50% EF with an indication for ICD, catheter ablation versus medical therapy. It was done by protocol within three months, within 90 days of the ICD implant, which is way earlier than clinical practice. And then use of antiarrhythmics were discretionary as well as epicardial advanced approaches during VT ablation, which are necessary for non-ischemics as we're all trained 
that MRIs teach us when they're ischemic versus non-ischemic, if there's mid-wall or epicardial scarring. So sometimes you need epicardial ablation, which again has never been assessed in a prospective trial. Exclusions were acute coronary syndromes, really bad heart failure, limited life expectancy. Um, so those are pretty standard. And we followed patients by protocol. And again, Asia has been accused of potentially non-systematic follow-up, but all these patients were seen at 3, 6, 12, 18, 24 with ICD interrogation. So the beautiful thing is you now have an ICD um, as, as the real objective marker of arrhythmia burden. The trial was organized with the University of Chicago uh, being the study sponsor, as well as the coordinating site. I served as a global PI. We had two in China that were the Chinese PI, one in Japan, one Korean, and one in Taiwan. We issued central randomization from Chicago. S significant adverse events were monitored and reported to us. Events were adjudicated independently to UCSF and Cedar sinai And then Abbott provided some funding support. This was very cool. They provided a fund for ICDs in patients that wanted to be part of it, but couldn't afford ICD. Uh, and then there was a national R&D funding from China to explore sudden death. We enrolled it on clinicaltrials.gov in 2016. So hard to believe this was over five years ago. And then we completed this March 5th. We did extend for a year because of COVID-19 and all the Chinese electrophysiologists were converted to first line workers and there was no follow-up in person. So we extended it for a year. Statistical analysis, we don't have to go over these power calculations. Hopefully this, this is in submission already. So hopefully these will come out, but we had certain estimates based on prior VT ablation trials, use Kaplan-Meier methods and forest plots. This is kind of the schema. We had 180 patients, 47 declined ICD and were enrolled in this ablation registry. 133 were randomized, 67 and 66 to control versus ablation with ICD. There were some withdrawals before any treatment, which led us to 60 versus 61. That seems very low in a heart failure trial. That seems very low in an interventional trial. We get that. This is EP. BT is highly specialized. Even these ablation trials are very hard to pull off partly because so many patients come already expecting ablation, they don't wanna be randomized. That was the problem with Cabana. We couldn't enroll because everyone wants to come for an AFib ablation. So you can't stop them and say, let's not ablate you and then not allow crossovers. So that's a real concern with intention to treat analysis. So the results are as follows. Table one shows that we had very successful randomization. There were no differences except for more males in the control. Everything else, was very similar with regard to disease profiles as well as uh, treatments and clinical presentations. The median age was 55. It was a third ischemic, a third non-ischemic, a third ARVC, also a population not explored previously. We'll talk a little bit about how there's a very high prevalence of ARVC in Asia, which is ripe for more scientific exploration. Average EF was when you average them all, all with ARVC, typically having preserved LV function was 40%. Those were the EFs across the different etiologies. And there's a very high incidence of tolerated VT in the study because it's Asia. And you've got a lot of people coming from the village and there's a selection bias for those that actually live to get to a tertiary referral center. So many of these patients are coming in with a 12 lead documented VT. Um, so cardiac arrest was very low. So there has, that has some issues with generalizability. But again, if this is without defibrillator, this is what you're gonna get. Amiodarone was used in just over a third of patients and ablation was performed on average two days prior to the uh, ICD implantation. The registry cohort was a little bit different than those randomized. These patients didn't have defibrillator and the ones that refused defibrillator tended to be younger, tended to have less ischemic cardiomyopathy and more ARVC and tended to have more normal LV ejection fractions. Maybe that's because physician bias is present because they're more comfortable saying and not forcing an ICD and saying you really need this. And ARVC may be relatively lower risk for sudden death if they have a normal LV function. So the rest of it, there were no significant differences in terms of clinical presentation, amio and male. Ablation techniques go a little bit beyond the scope of a general cardiology audience, but we actually went 
over 50% of the times they went epicardial. So that is a very specialized procedure to try to address and acknowledge epicardial and midmyocardial substrates. Various, very standard approaches, including mapping VT itself, looking for late potentials, looking at abnormal functional abnormalities during sinus rhythm were used. So this is all very contemporary practice beyond the scope of this presentation. On average, we ablate for about 45 minutes in these procedures, and the procedures take about four hours long, which is actually not bad, given that all of us have those horror stories of 10-hour VT ablations. So moving to the results. Any questions before we get to the results? Yes, I guess these were somewhat more well-tolerated VT patients. Is that what, is that what you're Correct, talking? and that's why 45 were clinically tolerated. So that has issues with, you know, extrapolating data and generalizability, for sure. And in terms of the mortality, in terms of the hard endpoints, it's probably going exactly. to Exactly. You're going to enrich that to a lower risk population overall. Right. So it'll probably be more you know, inappropriate or appropriate shocks or aborted. aborted. Exactly. Okay. Any other comments or questions before the we get to What were the non-ischemics? Are they just... Uh, These were like idiopathic dilated you know, some valvular, but you know, this is that wastebasket term of post viral in quotes that we like to ascribe. Okay. So they didn't get MRIs to make sure that there's no infiltrated disease, that kind of stuff. No systematic MRIs. It was discretionary. And, and that's actually a good point. We could look at that as well to understand the non ischemic substrate there in Asia, but they don't do that as readily in Asia as we do here. I think for us, new cardiomyopathy gets an MRI these days. Right. There's probably a hashtag MRI first. There's a hashtag radial first. There's probably a hashtag MRI first somewhere. So um, the drum roll here, primary outcome, Kaplan-Meier analysis of the two in patients that were randomized to catheter ablation, they were afforded a 42% risk reduction p-value of 0.035 for the primary composite endpoint. And again, to remind you, the primary composite endpoint were these specific individuals. VT recurrence is what drives it. So here's VT recurrence alone, highly significant hazard ratio of 0.51. So 50% reduction in recurrent VT, if you ablate them at the, odds, at, the odds, at, at the onset of their presentation with their defibrillator. But nobody does that in clinical practice. We put the defibrillator in, send you home on amio, and see how you do. Then if you get shocked, we'll think about it. Right, but that's not what we do, but this is pretty compelling. Then we talk a little bit about cardiovascular hospitalizations, a trend, not significant. And then mortality, too low to tell, single digit numbers, less than 8% in both arms. There's a trend towards actually a little bit higher mortality, but I think with such small numbers, it's hard to say. And what's most interesting potentially in the non-randomized group, when you put that registry arm in that got ablated without defibrillator, they do a little bit better than ablation with ICD. Granted, they were a little bit different of a subtype, but they actually do better than the control statistically. You know, control has a hazard ratio of 1.88 for those that are getting routine therapy with a defibrillator versus just ablating without an ICD. And there was no differences in deaths, but those were, again, were very low single digit, digit percentages. So when you look across subgroup analysis with forced um, exploration here, you can see the results were fairly consistent across all subgroups, only patients with atrial fibrillation and, and males tended to do a little bit worse from ablation, didn't have that trend, but these are, there was major underrepresentation. You can see AF was nine patients and females were underrepresented as they almost always are, sad to say, in cardiovascular, um, but there's, there's not fair representation to really look at this fairly, but this was pretty consistent across the board. ARVC tended to do better, but this was not significant compared to ischemic and non-ischemics with ablation compared to medical therapy. Adverse events, there were 8% procedural risk, procedural risk associated. But again, when you look at mortality, there were no differences. There were some pretty crazy and untoward effects here, type B aortic dissection, aortic valve leaflet perforation. But I want to emphasize that that was done with a retrograde approach. And we typically in the US do transeptal approaches for this exact reason. That there was a 2% incidence of, of events in the ablation registry. There was a perforation as well. And with deaths, 
these numbers were low. It was five, four versus three. These are tiny numbers, not really powered for mortality, but no overt signal for one way or the other. Limitations of the study is the limited sample size. It's only 121 patients. There is bias. We talked about the referral bias, tolerated VT, patients coming in. Maybe there's more RARVC in the registry. And there's discretionary utilization of antiarrhythmics. But we did that to really make it a real world study. Because if you randomize this against no antiarrhythmic, who does that? But then if you mandate it against amiodarone, not everyone does that as well. So we left it discretionary in both groups. And single chamber devices could confound accurate diagnosis of the appropriateness of ICD therapy. So in conclusion, New York, in patients with monomorphic VT and structural heart disease of etiologies, early first-line catheter ablation at the time of ICD implantation reduces the primary composite endpoint of VT recurrence, cardiovascular hospitalization, or death, but again, largely driven by a reduction in VT recurrence. So many people to thank in this regard, and I'll leave it to you. So thank you, Rod. That's a, a great synopsis of the study, and I, I want to congratulate you on really uh, an important study. You know, it really reminds me of, you know, the fact that you make a point, and I think the registry, I think, is one of the most interesting parts of the study because patients are getting VT ablation only without ICD. And it reminds me a little bit about sort of his bundle pacing and left bundle branch area pacing in China because out of necessity, because patient, you know, they didn't, they couldn't, patients couldn't afford CRT. Uh, mm -hmm. Now we're kind of like left with this opportunity to learn about physiologic pacing. And then here we're sort of learning about, you know, and I think, you know, the registry, I mean, there are a few caveats. I think, you know, 70% of the registry group were ARVC. And I think your study really clearly underscores that patients with ARVC, and again, kudos to the, you know, operators in your study, you know, it was, you know, almost, you know, greater than 50% of patients had epicardial ablation, I think. Um, so the patients seem to respond well with ARVC. And now we sort of know how patients can do without ICDs in this group. And I wanted to see if you want to comment on that. Well, the, the, the very rampant prevalence and incidence of ARVC in Asia needs to be explored globally. I'm not certain that they all have ARVC. They don't do routine genetic testing for PKP and, you know, placoglobin. So this is, maybe a lot of these are sarcoid mimickers. Maybe there's a different disease entity. There, I'm hoping someone is here a little bit inspired by that with regard to discipline to, to help us explore that. But this certainly does lay the groundwork for another ablation trial with, for ARVC alone with preserved LV function without ICD. That would be a great one because that, you know, Hopkins leads the way with the ARVC, you know, research with their group in America. But I think it'd be great to be able to test this there. And I'm not sure if there are ethical concerns, but this here shows that the rates are relatively low and might be a good justification for another pilot trial there. But ARVC is the real question. And I'm, I think we've all understood that there are many things that mimic ARVC. And just because your RV doesn't look great and you get a left bundle branch block VT doesn't mean you have ARVC. So we need to understand this better with genotyping, phenotyping, biopsies. Italy has led the way, but we thought that ARVC was a problem from the Veneto region of Italy. And it's not. You know, this is pretty prevalent across Asia as well. I'm not as aware with India, um, but I am told that there are a lot of ARVCs in India as well. Got it. And what, one question I think came from Sunit. I think a lot of the uh, endpoints were driven by VT recurrence. Um, do you have a sense of how many of the VT re uh, recurrences were um, were driven by um, by ICD you know, were, were manifest as ICD shocks versus ATP? Yeah, it was about 50-50. We have that. We're, we're we've prepared that for the manuscript, but it's about 50-50. And there there are many patients that receive both, as we know clinically. <laughs> So we kind of counted all the different therapies. So the number of shocks and ATPs is more than 100% of the population. So many receive both too. Got it. Hey, Rob, and then, I got you, but because yeah. as Hari said, you're gonna bias it to less people presenting with VF and shocks. Right. There's gonna be more ATPs, maybe even patients unde undetected, but that's where you also have mortality in there to catch the stuff that might not be detected, but if they don't die, then that's, that's a, exceptional news. I had a question about, um, it, seemed, it seemed like the majority of the benefit was in the first three to six months and then it just tracked. What is the biologic mechanism for that? 
Uh, I think that goes with our experience from University of Chicago that the patients that recur usually recur pretty early. You kind of know when you've got a good VT ablation or not. And I think all of us know that. And you know when you walk out and there's 10 VTs and you're like, this one's not going to do great. Versus when you really have a couple, things look great. They get totally non-inducible. Everything's very clean. Um, so I do think that VT recurrences, unlike AF, do happen early. And once you get past to about six months, and this is a data set from Chicago that was summarized in circulation two years ago, they tend to do well and kind of splay apart. Then the issue is competing risk with heart failure, you know, for mortality and cardiovascular hospitalization. But we still need to power a VT trial to look at mortality. But I love the discussion of why we've never shown mortality benefit. If near Uriel is on here, he's like, but Rod, Rod, we've never shown VT ablation decreases mortality. So let's talk about why that's the case. First of all, heart failure docs are doing un unbelievable things. And if you really go back and look at defibrillator trials, rates of beta blockade and made it were like 50%. Contemporary GDMT, you don't even talk about SGLT2 inhibitors, right? And that, it, they weren't even beta blocked. So it's really hard to know what would happen in these trials. And then, you know, you look at RNAs and things, they may reduce arrhythmic deaths too. So we do need more trials with contemporary bat baseline therapy, background therapy. So how was the medical therapy in both these arms? Was that also assigned? Uh, beta blockers were over 90, ACE inhibitors were like 70 or 80. So they were pretty good. And a lot of them were ARBC, which is, which is you know, in question. But the point is mortality benefits very hard to show with great G GDMT because heart failure has done such a good job. It's very hard to show with an ICD because it's so darn effective to abort sudden death. And then you also, when you're in a VT ablation trial, are going to have crossovers. If someone's in storm, are you going to let them continue to storm and die? You pretty much will then do a salvage ablation, even if they were randomized. So in order to show mortality benefit, you would also not have to allow crossovers. And some people would have to just be allowed to die. If they went in assessment VT, you say, this patient's in a trial, don't care. Because once you cross that patient over with intention to treat, then you salvage one life and there's no mortality in that arm. So there are major problems with us for all the people that are not EP and for the near urials of the world. I love near if he's watching. Those are our challenges. But we also need to have a huge study to show mortality benefit as the heart failure and interventional colleagues show. I mean, prove it, Timmy22 didn't show mortality benefit. These are quintuple endpoints that are driven, you know, by TVR and troponin leaks. So we need large, large trials and VT ablation four hours each is tough to get that big, but we need global collaboration. And I, I think, you know, to underscore the point, timing is everything. There's like a there's like a golden period, I think, that you want to hit them. Because I think your study is in line with the other studies showing that the EFs are relatively preserved, probably do the best. Once sure. you wait for the EFs to go below 40, 30%, even the other studies like, you know, um, like a, a Berlin VT uh, and I think... Uh, SMF. Uh, yeah, show that like, you know, you want to get them when they're not too, too sick. So it's tough. It's tough to design a trial to show the, 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 the mortality benefit while kind of squeezing in that fine line. Yeah, and there's certainly a sweet spot for VT ablation. And that's where I'm a strong advocate of heart failure EP collaboration. We really need to figure out where it's the point of no return. And that's obviously a daily struggle where someone's like, this is really better treated with a VAD. And then we say, well, VADs are not antiarrhythmic. VADs are pro-arrhythmic, but how do we treat this ahead of time, right? And if this is decimal transplant, then why even touch that patient? So we've got to figure out where that threshold is. And that's the ongoing exploration, you know, with the collaboration between heart failure and EP. This is clearly not the pre-VAD state patients. Right. Speak of VAD, I think there's, if we have time for some more questions, there's a question about um, v, the role for VT ablation at time of VAD, actually which is oh. peripheral to your, your trial, but I'm, you know, you, I'm sure you got an opinion on that. Yeah, and love that. Um, the worst, so my thoughts on VAD with VT, obviously a source of frustration. The RV is not supported for destination settings. They come back in with a rehospitalization, right? They come back in with slow VT. The worst is whenever it's a non-ischemic and that VT is epicardially based. So as Eminem said, you only get one shot. And it's true for VAD, for epicardial, we need to start thinking about the patients that are at very high risk with an epicardial substrate to ablate them intraoperatively at the time of VAD. 
And I think that that you, Rochester has an NIH grant yes. that is now looking at that. I love that. I'm self-inviting here, but that's something that we've gone into. And, and I saw that on Twitter and congrats to Rochester for that. We have to get in there at the time in the select population. It can't be all. And then let the endocardial stuff take its shape as it may play out, I think down the road, because then they're supported. The one concern that Nier had at Chicago was that endocardial VT ablation may increase the rate of pump thrombosis. That data came from Columbia University of Chicago. It is fraught with some limitations, but is very important and provocative. Because obviously when you're ablating in a closed circuit and you're denuding an epithelium, there's char, you could imagine a case in which that's not great. And if someone is predisposed to thrombosis, that may do it. That was associative. There were some anticoagulation non-compliances. There were some suspected pump thromboses that were not actually confirmed. Well, that data, it's not clear, but I'm reassured that with Momentum 3 and HeartMate 3, levitation may actually be protective. So I would still advocate for us to get into, think about getting into the OR for epicardially based substrates that have already shown VT. Ziv et al. from Columbia showed that 30 to 40% of patients that didn't even have VT will have VT after VAD. So then you could think about prophylactic there, but I think at least the patients that had storm and a lot of VT beforehand need to be thought of in a collaborative way between the surgeons, heart failure, and EP. Yeah, I 100% agree because, uh, and, and that's where having buy-in from your surgical colleagues is key because, you know, you got to work together. The collaboration there is key because you don't want to prolong their case too long, but then you want to be in there and make sure whatever you do do is going to be effective and durable. This is where the transplant meetings really need to evolve and have the EP and interventional cardiology more at the table uh, for things that they may not be thinking about. So I think that's where the future is going to. And I, and I think again, like there's thoughtful interventionalists, heart failure docs are always thoughtful. EPs sometimes are not thought to be thoughtful because we're like just a pro ablation, but that's totally changed here, you know, with these dialogues. That's why I love this cross special subspecialty collaboration because that's the real sweet spot and that's the art of medicine is figuring out when we shouldn't be ablating. And that's something, you know, I owed a near when we were talking a lot of stuff. You guys have a great one there, you know, looking over your heart failure team where we really would go back and forth and say, you know, this is too late. This is not late enough. But those answers need to be answered prospectively of when is it too late? So we'll see. There's much work to do together. Great. Okay, great. So thank you, Jim. Thank you, Rod. Um, we're coming up on the half an hour. So I want to thank you for an excellent presentation. Hopefully our listeners have learned a lot. Uh, Dr. Vadula is also here. She'll be taking over the next two from HFSA. We'll be deciding which ones will be the uh, key late breaking that we want to bring onto this stage. And uh, hopefully you'll all join us for that as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank Harry. Thanks, Rod. Thank you. Thank you.